Hey there folks, Lenny Rudeau here from Fish Talk Magazine. Tonight, I want to welcome you to Chesapeake Perspectives. We're here to talk about invasive species, like this guy right here, the blue catfish. People, this guy is causing a lot of havoc in our waterways. They're basically taking over in some areas. The amount of biomass is just shocking. And this is problematic because this is an invasive species, and he is eating up all those baby yellow perch, rockfish, crabs gosh we don't even know what and that's a big part of the problem here we really don't know exactly what the impact of this fish's spread is so tonight let's discuss it with some experts hey there folks i'm lenny rudo angler in chief of fish talk magazine a lifelong chesapeake bay angler and your host for tonight well Tonight's all about invasive species, and don't forget, we want to know what you want to know. Feel free to put your questions into the comments. Zach, our wizard behind the curtain, will field them. He'll get them up on screen. As things occur to you, folks, just plug them right into the comments and ask away. But before we get started, we need to ask, uh, we need to thank our partners for making Chesapeake Perspectives a reality. These are organizations and companies that have stepped up to help support a recreational angling community here on the Bay. So thank you, CCA Maryland, Yamaha Wrightwaters, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, the American Sport Fishing Association, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, Boat US, and the Marine Trades Association of Maryland. But most importantly, I wanna thank you anglers for tuning in now, for becoming more involved and better educated anglers. Uh, Zach, why don't we go ahead and put up slide one. Let's take a quick peek at the fish we're going to talk about today. Um, we have at the top the flathead catfish. Then we have underneath of him the blue catfish. Underneath there, there's also the channel cat. Now, the channel cat has been here for a long time and is no longer considered an invasive. But I wanted to include him on this slide just so everyone could take a peek because, you know, personally, sometimes I have trouble telling these guys apart. Uh, go ahead and throw up the next slide, if you would, please, Zach. The snakehead, the northern snakehead. This is a big one, right, people? Now, why should we care so much about these invasive species? There's several reasons. The first is opportunities. I mean, if you've ever seen a snakehead wake at a bait and then slam that thing, you felt a rush of adrenaline. I know you have. It, it, it's impossible not to. They are an incredible sport fish. Blue cats have really good things about them. They, they provide tremendous action. I was fishing on a boat about a month ago for them. We had six rods, and at any given time, three of them were going down. Just incredibly fast-paced, great action. And they're good to eat. Well, shucks, I forgot to say, snakeheads are incredible to eat, if you haven't yet. Flatheads have their advantages. They get really, really big. Some guys really get into going after those ginormous fish. And there's an environmental aspect to this, uh, The, you know, is unknown at this point. And we're going to get into all of that. But along with it, meanwhile, we've got commercial guys making a living from blue cats. We've got charter boats going after the blue cats. We've got guides going after the snakeheads. We've got uh, kayak fishermen who are taking out parties on the eastern shore just for snakeheads. So we have some real economic benefits here. But there's also a big negative side, and that's their impact. What's happening to all those baby rockfish? What's happening to all those baby perch? What's happening to all those crabs? And a big part of the problem here is that we don't necessarily really know exactly what these impacts are in all cases. Well, to help gain a better understanding of how we recreational anglers can play a constructive role in managing these fish, and maybe even how we can help you know ourselves catch a few more, uh, we've got some hard-hitting experts with us today. First up, Dr. Joseph Love. Dr. Yeah. Joseph. Hey, Joe. Hey. Um, Joe's a graduate of Mississippi State University and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore who joined the DNR in 2009. As program manager for freshwater fisheries, he is on the department's invasive species matrix team. Whew, that's a mouthful. Yes, it is. <laughs> He's helped author management plans for snakeheads, blue cats, and flatheads. Joe, I got a question for you right off the bat. Yes, sir. 
have you caught any one of these three invasive fish in the past year? And if so, was it by accident or on purpose? Well, okay, so we have caught, I have caught all three of them uh, using electrofishing. <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking hook and line. We're hook and line in here. But but with hook and line, it's uh, unfortunately all I can say is I hooked it to a snakehead. That's okay. it. Yeah, I've got I've got that under my belt uh, in the past year. That's it. Okay, good enough. Yeah. Next up, let's bring in Dr. Noah Bressman. He's an assistant professor of physiology who has researched invasive species for over a decade, focusing on invasive fish species in Maryland since 2017. Currently, he's focused on the diet, reproduction, growth rates, defenses, and ecology of the blue catfish on the eastern shore, as well as the ecology of northern snakeheads and their amphibious adaptations. Noah is also a fish artist and an avid angler on a mission to catch every species of fish currently at number 450. That's ambitious, Noah. I love it. <laughs> Only 33,000 more to go. I'm <laughs> almost there. Awesome. Let me ask you the same question. In the past year... Have you caught a blue cat, a flathead, or a, or a, 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 a snake? Oh, good Lord. Or yeah. a northern snakehead. Excuse me. Yeah, I've caught uh, snakeheads. I've actually won some kayak snakehead fishing tournaments on the eastern shore while also collecting data for my research. Um, I've caught blue catfish. Didn't win any fishing tournaments, but entered some blue catfish tournaments and got data from those. But we don't have any flathead catfish on the eastern shore, so I haven't got them here. But I used to catch them when I was in North Carolina, where they're also not native. Very cool. Okay. Well, folks, we have one other person introduced. That is Mary Groves. She's a DNR regional manager and unfortunately wasn't able to join us on camera tonight, but she's tuned in. She stands ready to answer our questions, especially as they pertain to the Potomac and the Patuxen. So, uh, you know, before we go any further, I think I'm going to ask everybody watching the same question. I want to take a little bit of a poll. Everybody, please enter in the comments right now. And this can be as simple as a yes or a no. Have you caught any of these three species in the last year? And if so, was it by accident or were you targeting them? I'm really curious to see what the anglers out there have to say. Now, while you folks are typing that in in the comments, we're going to start off with snakeheads. And I'm going to pitch Mary a question first to give her time to answer since she has to type it while well, we discuss the same type of thing in other waterways. In the Potomac, which was one of the first to be invaded by the snakeheads, I've been led to believe that they actually coexist pretty well with native species. So Mary, could you address that and let us know if they're generally seen as the same type of threat today as they were, you know, a decade, 15 years ago. And Mary, while you're typing in your answer, we're gonna jump over to Dr. Joe because I believe you studied this on the Blackwater and you sent me some great slides, but honestly, they made my head hurt. Oh, that's I okay. I thought I was going to black out, look at all the graphs and numbers. <laughs> but well, those, those people with science brains, you can see the entire study for yourself. We have a link. Zach, if you could throw the link up there at the Fish Talk uh, website, fishtalkmag.com. We put it on the Chesapeake Perspectives page. So just go to that page. You can click on the link and read the whole study. But in the meantime, Joe, please give us the bottom line. Is there scientific evidence that snakeheads have had an impact on native species in the Blackwater? There is evidence that snakeheads have impacted the relative abundance of the species that they typically prey upon in the Blackwater. Um, they have not caused an extinction. Uh, they haven't caused extinction of any species in the Chesapeake Bay, but the very fact that they are a predator implies that they negatively impact the ecosystem. And the fact that we can track changes in relative abundance indicates that snakeheads are a threat to our natural resources. Can you give us a few examples of some of the species that impact was actually evidenced? So uh, sunfishes, right? And white perch and yellow perch and killifish. These are all species that are popular prey items for snakeheads that we've evidenced from work done on the Potomac and elsewhere. And they are 
targets that we would expect to have their relative abundances change. And I'm not saying that's going to be true of everywhere there are snakeheads, um, but I am saying that they can be a threat in some ecosystems. Okay. Now, Dr. Noah, you have you, you have no dog in the Potomac versus Blackwater fight. You've studied them all over the place. Yep, I've studied fish on the western shore, eastern shore, been all around. So uh, just how different can the impact of the snakehead be from one system to the next? Well, even on the eastern shore, like Joe was saying, uh, the types of fish they're eating in black water, in even different bodies of water on, uh, on the eastern shore, we've seen snakeheads eating different prey items. Uh, uh, just this last uh, year, my lab, while doing our research to figure out more about the diet of uh, blue catfish and starting, uh, starting up a product on snakeheads, the very first snakehead we got while electrofishing in the Nanticoke River had a uh, alewife in its stomach, a river herring, a threatened river herring. And so that's the first indication that they're eating these uh, migratory species that are, that are of, of concern. And so it, fish number one had that in its stomach, shows that they're probably eating some other things in, in depending on whatever is most abundant in the area and whatever is overlapping. And we were even seeing these these shad spawning in the shallows, slapping on the uh, herring spawning and slapping on the on the shoreline, and we saw snakeheads coming in and pouncing them like they do uh, to, a, to a frog on the surface, just in a in inches of water on those on those herring. And so, even nearby, they're having different effects in different ecosystems. So we we still only scratching the surface on the knowledge of that these fish are having uh, on their an ecosystem. So do we have any idea? I want to ask you about perch in specific, whites and yellows. And, and I'm asking because it's an area of concern for me personally. The perch runs are not what they used to be. Now, I know there are a million different variables that go into that, right? You got water quality. You got, you know, how much did it rain? I mean, there's a bazillion things coming into play here. Is it possible at this point to say that the snakehead is having an effect on, say, the perch run? on how many perch are around? I, I think anything is possible. Um, if we're looking at probabilities here, I think it's easy to say that snakeheads are a predator of white perch and that they could be affecting the young white perch relative abundance in some of these areas. Um, like you said, there are a number of factors influencing a population of fish like white perch, like climatic variables, as well as other predators, blue catfish in some areas, they eat white perch as well. So um, there are a lot of things going on in an ecosystem, but I think it's fair to say that snakeheads do play a role as a predator in these ecosystems, and there is a potential impact owed to snakeheads. And that's the reason why we still have laws prohibiting import of snakehead into this country. We still have laws prohibiting live possession of snakehead. We would not have those laws. Neighboring states would not have those laws. The Fish and Wildlife Service would not have those laws if all of these agencies didn't agree that Northern snakehead pose a potential threat to our native natural ecosystems in the United States. So it's funny, it's funny you bring up other states. Zach, can we go ahead and bring up the next slide, please? And let's make sure everybody knows just how widespread these fish have become, uh, because it, it really is, I would call it a very dramatic change in you know relatively recent years um and maybe uh dr noah would you like to address uh, look at look at this i mean they're basically they've gone everywhere <laughs> so oh, yeah. why why do these fish spread so darn well it's they've also been something that helped with their spread is they were introduced recently into oh well, not recently like about almost 20 years ago into the arkansas well they were being farmed in arkansas too uh, totally legally just like you would farm other fish and mm -hmm. Somehow it's, it's thought that they got, uh, basically they were found in Maryland and then these people were told, Hey, we got to get rid of the, uh, you got to get rid of your fish. It's going to be listed as invasive. So, uh, somehow they got from that pond to the a, a tributary of the Arkansas river and then got into the Mississippi. So what you're not seeing here is too, is they're now in the Mississippi river. They're going to spread pretty much everywhere. The Mississippi and the tributaries can connect as well as some areas like in Georgia and further something that 
anecdotally I've, I've heard is it's thought that the guy to get rid of those snake heads in Arkansas drained his pond and threw the snake heads on the shore. And they're like, well, there they are, fish on the shore, they're going to die. But snake heads can breathe air. And uh, through some research that I did with Joe, they have the ability to successfully move over uh, overland. They're not going to move miles and miles over land. And they'd only come out when water quality is bad or they're in um, under stress or specific conditions like somebody physically putting them on land to die. But they can survive out of water for about a day and that gives them time to move. And perhaps that, that fish farm was close to a creek. They're able to move over land to get to that creek entered in the Mississippi. I think it's a rare occasion where snakeheads are getting from one body of water to a new body of water over land. But just one instance of them getting to the Mississippi like that is a huge uh, issue because now the Mississippi is like half the country's watershed. And so snakeheads, it potentially in areas that, that flood are really shallow, they could take advantage of flooding to move through extremely shallow water, like go over a road from one body of water to another body of water. But in general, they're just so hardy that they are really easy to, they can survive all sorts of conditions, including being caught in one location, put in a bucket with no water, driven several hours away to another location and dumped in somebody's backyard where they can catch the fish. Yeah. And so <laughs> I think th those, that ability to survive on land and breathe air and all and extreme water conditions uh, can help them move over land uh, to an extent to new bodies of water. But the main cause is likely humans moving them one body of water over another. Well, they yeah. certainly are shockingly hardy. I mean, I know I've come home after I thought one of them was dead for six hours and then, you know, picked it up and it started flopping around. And I'm just like, what's going on? I mean, they are amazing. Um, Dr. Joe, I got a, I got another question for you here because in our notes for tonight, we came across this term biomass equilibrium. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I, I wonder if you could just give us a couple a little bit of insight on on what is this equilibrium thing and have we studied it when it comes to snakeheads in the chesapeake sure so there's this there's this idea that the population of snakeheads in some of these areas or these areas where they're introduced or established populations will those populations will grow to an equilibrium size to a set size that's dictated by the availability of resources in that ecosystem, basically a carrying capacity. And biomass is simply just another way of looking at abundance just through pounds rather than counts. So it's really just achieving that. And there are some areas, for example, on the Potomac River where we've conducted surveys in Virginia, um, Department of Wildlife Resources have conducted surveys and we see that the relative abundance, which is what we measure, we don't measure biomass, but the relative abundance of snakeheads uh, fluctuates around maybe an equilibrium point. But there are things that affect that. Um, harvest is one of them. In fact, commercial harvest for snakeheads on the Potomac has dropped a little bit um, and we've seen increases in the abundance of snakehead here recently, um, but not to a level of peak, which is what we saw in 2010, 2011. And, you know, that peak is likely owed to the fact that there wasn't as much harvest out there. So we do recognize that harvest does play an important role in regulating biomass out there. And it is something that can affect the equilibrium point of um, biomass of snakeheads in these rivers okay so you correct me if i'm wrong but just to put it into the most basic terms po possible we're talking you got the predator you got the little bitty white perch or whatever and there are tons of little bitty guys so the new predator comes in and he just eats like crazy and reproduces like crazy because he's having a good old time but then eventually there aren't so many little baby white perch left and the predator's numbers start to drop and then they hit Kind of a, is it fair to say a plateau where everything so, sort of evens out? So th yeah, that's that's one way of looking at it. Except that snakeheads are opportunistic and they eat a, not just white perch, but a lot of different other things. As Noah pointed out, it could be frogs. <laughs> there are some some examples of uh, of uh, small ducks, small small mammals. So they, they're opportunistic. Crayfish, for example, 
And there's a lot of food in the Chesapeake Bay. And it's not just food that may limit the biomass of snakeheads, right? Their habit, they, they got specific habitat types. They've got, um, you know, other predators in the ecosystem that may be eating the offspring of snakehead. For example, um, largemouth bass might be eating those offspring. So um, there are other things that affect that biomass equilibrium, not just the availability of food. Um, but that's certainly, you know, one of the more important things that keeps, um, you know, biomass levels where it is in an ecosystem. All right. We got a question in from Michael. While you're seeing equilibrium of snakeheads, are you also measuring their prey concurrently? Is that type of study going on right now? Yes, Noah is doing some work with uh, with stable isotopes on the eastern shore, and we've done plenty of work measuring prey uh, items in snakeheads um, from various systems in the upper bay or in the, the Potomac River where where we collect them. So yes, that that work is is ongoing. Good, I'm glad. And I got a very important ecological follow up question for you. What Joe? is your favorite snakehead lure my favorite snakehead lure yes. oh oh <laughs> Come on, well, it's boring, nice. what know. yeah all right well i tell you um i my my primary job is managing bass fisheries so when i fish i use artificial tackle and i'll use like spinners and that's what i use oftentimes when spinners. i'm not fishing and that's what i yeah that's what okay. i can Okay. But I also use um, topwater creature baits, like little frogs, right? But it's usually, well, it's most always just artificial baits. But okay. I know on the eastern shore, they use live minnows or, or um, cut bait that seems to work out okay, too, you know. Noah, what's your, what's your uh, go-to snakehead lure? So my go-to snakehead lure, I would say, well, it's whoever will give me a sponsor for a snakehead lure. No, <laughs> but... Uh, but um, it's either between a, a white chatter bait or a white uh, inline spinner bait like a MEPS. Um, if it's if it's super dense, I go more chatter bait. Uh, super dense vegetation, I go more chatter bait. So it's just like a snag, and just fish it real slow along the edge of structure or on seams of lily pads. Uh, works great. Okay, Mary, if you got a favorite snakehead lure, please chime in. Let us know what it is. Meantime, I do have a kind of a weird question that I'll just put out there and. Whoever feels like attacking it, feel free to. Um, we all know that snakeheads are escape artists, right? <laughs> yes. Like, you haven't really caught it until it's dispatched and in your cooler under ice. Uh huh. You put it in the bottom of the boat, you got no guarantees, right? And uh, literally four days ago, I watched as one of my good friends lost a 30 plus inch snakehead that went over the side. And I've heard the theory that these fish are smart enough to look at their surroundings, consciously hatch an escape plan, <clears throat> and wait for the right moment to initiate it. Uh, what, like an octopus? I hear, I hear <laughs> octopi are very intelligent animals. Um, I don't know about that, but I can tell you that they are escape artists. We have, they're very strong animals and there's a lot of lateral muscle to them, as you know, if you filleted one, right? So, um, and the eyes are on top of their head. So they're oriented to look up and they have a lot of muscle and they leap up. So they get out of our containers very, whether they're planning on that, I don't know, but I do know they love to jump. They're like gazelles. And uh, I don't know if they're crafty. I didn't know, have you ever noticed whether they're plotting like a CSI episode? I don't, I don't know if they're if they're scheming or anything like that, but I definitely when I was doing experiments on how they move and orient on land, um, I definitely like I'd have them to, uh, with some camera right, and as I'm walking around them, uh, while they're out of the water, their eyes would follow me, and so they're definitely aware of their surroundings. I don't think they're necessarily planning ahead, but they may see there's a predator over there. Me, I'm gonna go that way. I don't I know. I think they're smarter than my dog, personally. But yeah. <laughs> well, they are very, they so are very smart. I tell you what, I talk to a lot of anglers who hunt, uh, go after snakeheads, right? And some of them are surprised that it's so difficult to catch one. 
And, you know, I've, I've talked to people for, for years, like one in, 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 um, in the pond there in Salisbury, right? Uh, the pond right there at the Salisbury Zoo. And I was talking to people, they were casting straight on top of the head of the snakehead, but the snakehead didn't attack and bite. And, you know, the reality is they are a smart critter and um, it is not, you know, easy to catch one of them. So I'm sure they've got, a, you know, a little bit of intelligence to them. You know. that, that, that they're not easy to catch, I will attest to. Now, Mary mentioned earlier largemouth lures. Basically, if you're casting for largemouth with any largemouth lure, you're, you're probably, sooner or later you're going to hook a snakehead. And uh, she thinks they're really smart. And I gotta say, I think they're I think they're pretty darn smart. I think I think she's right. Some of the first anglers catching them were bass anglers on the Potomac River. You know, we had a couple mm -hmm. watermen there. They're really the first ones that that hit into them, but the uh, the bass anglers were hitting into them, and they were concerned about the bass fishery, and so that's in part why I got involved with snakeheads is to try and investigate whether there would be an issue owed to the snakeheads to the bass fishery, um, and so yeah, the people going, but now with snakeheads being practically everywhere in ditches and places where bass aren't. Um, I think the diversity of fishing styles has increased and now we have bow fishing out there. We're doing, we're, we're chartering two, uh, captains this year, bow fishing ca captains to go after snakeheads and learn the, the impact of bow fishing on snakeheads. So it's a, it's kind of the, the fishery for snakeheads is a lot more diverse now than it used to be. And it's a bit more diverse than it is for largemouth bass. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I would call it amazing. Now. Mike's got a really cool question. He's asking if there's any data on the diversity of the ecosystems in the snakehead's native waters. Are there anadromous species there competing in their native waters? That's a really interesting question. What's, what do we know what's going on with them at home? Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know, know if you want to punch in. There was a paper that came out of South Korea on snakeheads not too long ago and so you know snakeheads are from asia they're from south korea vietnam china areas and in part that's that's why they do so well in our waters because the climate is is somewhat similar uh to some of those areas so um out that way snakeheads do <laughs> consume freshwater prey there but i wouldn't say that they're i don't know if they're anadromous fish um because these you know, these snakeheads tend to be more wetland area species out that way. So I don't know if there's a lot of anadromous influx of, of, of herring-like species or eel-like um, species. But they certain, there are certainly studies out there that document the role of snakeheads in those aquatic ecosystems. And, and they, they are predators out there as well. It's just that they're a native predator there. So um, Actually, with largemouth bass now being introduced over there, that's the one that's causing a havoc in Asia, uh, you know, over there. Uh, that's, here we funny have and we, here. that's funny. We should point out while we're having this discussion, I think it's worth noting. A lot of people are surprised to learn that largemouth bass are actually not like a Maryland native fish. Mm -hmm. Right. That's they, right. They, they were introduced here. So, again, we're, we're right back to good points and bad points right it's a there's a there's a balance so yeah. struck, but we got positives and we got negatives but i do have to point out that you know bass were introduced in the late 1800s following the civil war following the burgeoning of baltimore right it was a very different landscape in the united states after the civil war and the u.s fish and wildlife service which is not it was the Bureau of Land Man or Bureau back then, but the Fish and Wildlife Service introduced them as a as a as a way of creating a, a forage base for the for people, right? So the rationale is very different. In this case, snakeheads were illegally introduced; they were not permitted. There were no risk assessments and um, conducted by the any federal government um, or state government to allow the introduction of the species. So it's a kind of a different situation. Um, than it was then for bass and i like to try and point that out because some people don't understand uh that um you know the, the rationale the differences in rationale there totally gotcha although i i'm i'm wondering if in 1860 they did any kind of threat assessment <laughs> yeah. i don't think it was around then no they just no. wanted to feed people 
No, they had a train and they put bass on the train and they literally played Johnny Appleseed across the country with them. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and that's why largemouth are so widespread now in, in the continental United States. Right. It's because interesting. Of yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, Zach, I'm going to ask if we have any snakehead questions that are waiting to go up. If we don't, I think we should probably jump. Oh, we do. Okay. Hold on. Oh, back, back off on going to flatheads. Michael is asking, now that they spread through the tributaries, a lot of striper spawning rivers since snakeheads and blue cats are opportunistic feeders. Is there any evidence that they're eating any young of the year stripers? Yeah. I'm, I'm in, in the blue catfish work we're doing on the Eastern shore. Uh, we've seen young of the year stripers. Heck we've seen 20 inch stripers in the stomachs of blue cats. Uh, 20 inch was in the stomach of a 30 inch blue cat. So like not that much bigger. Um, so it's not just young of the year, but even adults they're eating. Uh, they aren't the most abundant prey item in their diet, but the snipers aren't also the most abundant fish in the river. So it's a little bit, basically the catfish, uh, I'll get to a little bit more later. The catfish eat anything and everything they get by them. So a small striper coming in, they'll snatch that up. Now what imagine about the snakeheads? Imagine it's similar to the snakeheads. We have a lot smaller sample size of snakeheads because catfish are a lot easier to get. If you go electrofishing, you can shock up thousands of catfish in a minute. Snakeheads, you have to really go out and scoop one of them in a good day of snakehead electrofishing. We get like a dozen of them. What? Uh, they're, they're, it's because you have to go into like thick vegetation and areas your boat can't go to. They don't get stunned as well as the catfish. And so instead of being like floating up, um, basically like tasered, they just get angry just shoot out of the water and you have to kind of scoop them out midair or they're gone. And Are you so, telling me that they're even resistant to electricity? It's not that they're resistant. It just makes them angry. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> stun them. Um, and so we just haven't gotten much uh, data from electrofishing, uh, at least in the study we're doing yet. This is going to be a, a long-term study. So we're hoping for something called stable isotope analysis, where we take some tissue samples and we take some tissue samples from all the different prey items in the river. And then we basically compare the ratio of these isotopes, basically like a, like a signature of, of a chemical signature of each of these animals. And we can figure out which ones are the catfish eating and the snakeheads eating more of uh, relative. And so once we do finish that analysis, which will take a few, at least a few months, uh, we can determine are they, uh, are snakehead, uh, what species are snakeheads most eating. The problem with getting snakehead hook and line from anglers is Anglers will test it too. Anytime somebody catches them on hook and line, like 90% of the time, the stomach's empty. Because, and it's empty because that's why they're biting your lure. They're hungry, so they're going to they're gonna bite your hook. If they're full, they're not going to bite your hook. Whereas catfish will just keep eating and eating and eating until they're overflowing. Wow, that is interesting. Radio isotopes. That's, that's, that's why you got the PhD on your <laughs> you know, We got collaborators that I work with for the isotope stuff. So we got Dr. Christina Bradley at Salisbury University. She's the fish isotope expert, and so we work hand in hand together on this project. I can't take all the credit for that. That's very cool stuff. And Mary's adding that you only get one chance on them, oh, and yeah. then they're gone. No wonder. Um, Zach, whoop, we got another one. Uh, Adventures, what? Adventures of Iceberg Slim. Oh, huh. there are <laughs> lots of studies on how snakeheads are foraging on native fish, but have there been any on native fish foraging on snakeheads? So, you know, I dissect a lot of uh, bass, right, that come in from bass tournaments. And there are not, there, there are some cases where bass will eat snakehead, young snakehead, but it's not very common. Hmm. Um, the, uh, you know, the reality is that young snakeheads grow exceptionally fast uh, within their first year of life and up to eight inches, nine inches. And as a result of that fast rate of growth, you know, they're consuming a lot of fish where there's a lot of protein. So that supports that fast rate of growth. As they grow quickly, they escape the gate width, the, the mouth, th mouth size of a lot of our aquatic predators. Not all of them, right? So we see birds able to pick off snakeheads. You see maybe a snapping turtle able to pick off some catfish, blue cat, maybe able to pick off a, a snakehead, right? And then as they get bigger, right, there are fewer predators that are going to be able to pick them off, right? So that's where humans come into play. And that's why I'm so excited about 
you know, anglers, watermen, folks going after snakeheads to harvest for food, because that's exactly how that species is fished in its native environment, right? In Asia, it's an important food fish there. That's why it's in this country is because it was imported as a food fish, at least Northern snakehead was. And so I'm so excited that people are now part of this food web, right? So they are an important predator. So for, for those larger size snakeheads. And oh, and Tommy's saying he's caught bass going after the snakehead fry balls. Now those fry balls, they're still, that's pretty tiny ones, right? Yeah. And I, I tell you what, Fish and Wildlife Service, I got a buddy over there. He told me he has pulled off adults from their nests, right, that are guiding, guarding those fry balls. And those fry get picked off by predators like that because they're so small and they're shiny and they're obvious to other predators. So oftentimes I tell folks, you know, if you if you, you know, want to try and, um, you know, manage the you know, bi biomass of snakehead. If you want to try and be, you know, conservationist at heart there, you can remove or harvest those adults and the young uh, snakehead will be foraged on by other predators in the ecosystem. Hmm. Now, Simon's asking about making the snakeheads more of a sustainable food source and market sale to help control them. And I know a few years ago, I spoke with some commercial guys and they were scared to touch them because they didn't want to get in trouble because one would accidentally be alive in the, in the pile of fish when they hauled them, you know, to go sell them. Now I think that's changed. And, uh, this spring, early this spring, I was down on, it was on the shore. We were on the, on the chick and a commercial guy was launching his boat to go commercial snakehead fishing. So I think that's something that's actually happening now, right? It is. Yep. Cool. We don't have, it's still a very small fishery. Last year, I just pulled out the, pulled out the numbers. I think it was over 4 million pounds of cat, blue catfish were commercially harvested in the bay. Um, snakeheads, you're looking at maybe four or 5,000 pounds. So we're not, we're talking about a very small fishery. A lot of it is bow. Um, some of it is hook and line. Some of it is haul seining, but, um, you know, generally it's a small fishery. And part of that, based on the conversations I've, I've had with watermen and processors and restaurants, is that it's a seasonal fishery. Can't always get snakehead like you can catfish, right? Um, it's also difficult to get at the snakehead, um, as Noah was pointing out, in terms of catchability. So it's not, it's not a, a food source that's easy to get at um, for commercial harvest. So even though there is commercial harvest, it's just not as... I, um, so, big. so Gary's asking on the recreational level here, we're talking, should you behead them after they're caught and put them on ice for safety? Um, I've, I've personally struggled with multiple methods of trying to, uh, dispatch them. And, uh, actually it, it was advised to me to use a ball peen hammer and I mm -hmm. tried that and that worked pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, beheading them will definitely get the job done. Uh, personally, I like to use a framing hammer to, to, to get things start off or, or, or a welding hammer, um, where it's basically kind of like a little, it's like a hammer that comes to like a little bit of like a pickaxe kind of thing. And so not only does it like have a weight to like knock them out and, and knock them with what we call tech in the technical, in the meta, in the veterinary communities known as cranial concussion, but it will also puncture and like hit through the brain. And so it punctures and that's, that's what's known as pithing where you scramble the brains up. And so that's really effective at killing them, but it's not technically an approved method to transport snakeheads to confirm that they're dead uh, just because you have to do it right. I'm not sure if they change the regulations on that. But we, I think we, we did. So I, yeah, we did. The initially we had recommendations there because no one really knew how to kill snakeheads. So mm -hmm. we, we put out some recommendations, but here recently, I would say two years ago, we changed the regulations so that natural resource police has the responsibility of determining whether that fish is dead or not by any means used. So whether it's pithing an arrow through the head, um, you know, we recommended pulling gill arches during tournament because it was less bloody that way. But however, natural resource police determines that fish is dead, um, it's, it's the onus is on them. So we did change that regulation. All right. So uh, 
We're getting a question uh, from Jerry on well, what's DNR doing to manage snakeheads. I think that plays into the whole larger conversation, but this is also something that you guys are still basically figuring out, right? I mean, I mean, so, you know, in terms of managing species like snakehead, we've done it. We've, we've been consistent with messaging in terms of prevention. We have rules and regulations preventing the introduction of the species, right? We are actively engaging the recreational community to harvest snakeheads, right? Um, so that's kind of the messaging there. And we don't have any creel limits, any size limits, um, any season. So in terms of management like that, I mean, we're pretty hands off. Please go and harvest them. Open and season. No, no season, right? Yeah, and open season. If there's a if there's gear, you know, if there's a gear restriction that's preventing you from harvesting it, please let us know. Right now, uh, I don't. I don't know if you guys are going to know the answer to Steve Camboris's question. He's who he's who turned me on to the ball peen hammer, honestly. Yeah, that's uh, a good idea. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to know the answer, but how many other states have established populations of snakeheads now? It sounded like Noah, you may have some insight on this. Or Joe? Oh, no, you were. I that was you were muted. It sounds like we got Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, Georgia, uh, Arkansas, and now I think Mississippi, too. Um, there have been some yeah. areas, some places they've popped up, but then successfully eradicated or just one and there wasn't a population. Uh, I'm not sure if I said Delaware, but um, DC. Florida and Hawaii. Both of those states have them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You also have, there's a, my favorite population, just because of the comicalness of it, is in there's a population in New York City, um, in Queens, New York, um, and they've been successfully eradicated in other parts of New York. But in Queens, New York, it it's an island surrounded by salt water, and there's one pond on that island, pretty much in a park, and they're like they can't go anywhere, and there's no real native fish in this pond anyway. So they're, the the management strategy is just let it happen there. Hmm. Um, because they can't go anywhere else. Because do, pe do people go fish the pond? Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes we'll go fish the pond. But if you've ever tried going in New York City pond fishing, it's hard fishing because there's just so much people there. There's so much pollution. It's like imagine eight million people fishing, and the only freshwater fishing spot is a tiny little pond. Uh, <laughs> it's perfect. I, I went once, <laughs> and I, I couldn't even get a bluegill on on worms. It was rough. <laughs> So, uh, so Mike's asking now about tagging studies. Do is that happening with? I mean, how do you tag a fish? You're supposed to kill as soon as you catch. I do do you tag study? Do you tag studies? We do. We do. We we actually work initially with uh, Virginia, DC, and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to tag snakeheads on the Potomac River in various, in, you know, respective jurisdictions. Uh, there, we were learning something about population size, movement patterns. Now I'm working with Fish and Wildlife Service and we've tagged some fish on the Potomac River uh, tidal portion and then some fish in the upper bay, gunpowder, sassafras river in the flats. And those tags are meant to measure exploitation or harvest, how many learn how many people are actually eating snakeheads. And those are reward tags. So some tags out there are worth two hundred dollars and some tags are worth ten dollars. So if someone catches one of those snakeheads and reports the tag and, and harvests the fish, um, I'll, I'll cut them a ch well, the state will cut them a check. I'll just I'll just work out the paperwork. Uh, as as good as those fish taste, I don't know why anybody would not harvest one. But that's just me. I do think they they've become like my favorite freshwater fish to eat of any of them. It's oh, absolutely. Amazing. When it's you're catching amazing. 100 in a day, though, I mean, your freezer fills up very fast. You know, and I've talked to people who have caught 100 in a day. You know? I, I have not. I have okay. not caught 100 in a day. That's, okay. why, that's why I have students to, to fillet my fish for me. And we have like, a lot of freezer stocked. And whenever Sweet. anybody comes by, like, gives a, a seminar to the department. And I'm like, have you ever tried snakehead? They're like, no. Here's some snakehead fillets. Go, go try some. You got a vacuum sealer, too. Fillet very station. Nice. It, it, it's very efficient. We got it down. All right, we're going to take Randy's question, and then we gotta we gotta keep moving because we we haven't even we haven't dug into the cats yet, um, and we can circle back on questions later, maybe if we end up with time, or if there are other questions, we can go in and answer them in the comments afterwards. But let's let's get Randy first. He's asking, are they around Tangier or Chrisfield? And I'm curious to hear your answer. What what do you got? 
would say not really. Um, they're they they can tolerate low salinity, like a little bit of salinity, a little bit brackish in tidal rivers, but around Tangier, Chris Field, that's getting a little too salty for them. And so, they can survive that for a little bit, but they're not going to stick around. I, I was particularly curious about it because maybe three years ago, there were several that popped up near Chris Field that were either in crab pots or people found them like they were so out of it that they just drove up and netted them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is probably because they what they just swam too far down river. Could have been a storm washes them down like a lot of fresh water. They go further down, mm. the fresh water washes out, they get stuck in a crab pot, salt water comes back and they're kind of stranded. Yeah, they're okay. Um, Okay. Actually, so, some research that I, I did with Joe actually showed that if the water gets too salty, snakeheads may actually leave the water if they have the opportunity. Yeah, that and we, you know, we have there have been reports of of snakeheads being found. I remember seeing a picture of a snakehead at the mouth of the Potomac, heading down <laughs> down the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay, sitting right where you may expect to find a ray on sand. And it was pretty salty during the summer. It was like June or July, just chilling um, there. And we expect that it was probably just passing through. But look, these fish passed through the mouth of the rivers and headed into the Patuxent River. So we know that they're guiding themselves along the main stem of the bay. So they do have some brackish water tolerance there but i think we've measured up to for those of you who know uh, about 10 parts per thousand um seawater is 36 38 parts per thousand so we're talking you know it, it's got the species has some tolerance but like no one mentioned it's not going to stay there very long and if it gets trapped in a net or uh crab pot then yeah chances are it's just gonna uh, yeah, we, we, had, we had several comments in there pop up real quick from, I guess, sightings. And one was from Chris on Smith Island, which that kind of shocks me. Smith Island, I mean, you're pretty darn salty yep. right there, you know. But he yep. did say he was acting weird. I, so, I saw I saw a picture of one out on Smith Island. It was in the boat dock. It was a few years ago. I saw a picture. Hmm. I didn't know if someone had just brought it over and released it. Uh, but, at, but at the time, but now that I've learned more about snakeheads, it's possible it just made it there from maybe an eastern shore river somehow well and and it's possible an osprey dropped it right possible I've, an osprey i've dropped seen it. osprey drop rockfish on the street so mm -hmm. yep, <laughs> that's, that's right the gizzard shad almost hit me coming from the sky <laughs> it happens <laughs> sounds all right, all right. <laughs> we did. are gonna shuffle on people we've got to talk flatheads zach can you bring up slide number five please because we got a whole different potential invasive species here right this is showing the distribution of the flathead catfish and um i'm, I'm going to ask mary if she'll start typing since there's a big concentration in the potomac and that's mary's area um i want to know since there's so many in the potomac zone are the flatheads seen as as big a threat as say the blue cats or potentially the snakeheads because They've been there for a while, too. And while Mary's typing that in, um, why don't you guys just, you know, one of you give me a quick synopsis as to why the flatheads haven't spread nearly the same way. Because they've been here longer, I believe, since the 60s, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, they're a little bit more habitat specialists. or diff <sighs> The estuarine habitats of the Chesapeake Bay are very neutrified. Uh, there's a lot of nutrients in the water. And so that's very good for blue catfish, but flathead catfish are a different animal and they don't respond to nutrients in the same way. So for a long time, they were just restricted to the Aquacon um, and to the lower Susquehanna. But here recently, um, we're starting to see them on the Potomac River, as Mary will say. Um, we now have them in the non-tidal Potomac, right? And now Mary mentioned, you know, they're they're spreading a little bit in the in the tidal Potomac. Um, tidal freshwater uh, now they're spreading. So not exactly sure why all of a sudden they're starting to spread. Maybe she has some insight on that, but um, that's more of a recent thing. Oh, here we go. Flatheads have been in the aquaquins since the 70s, but they're not nearly as mobile as blue catfish or northern snakehead. Okay. Okay. So um, how did they get all the way up inside? Is that just, if you look on the left of the map, uh -huh. they're way inland. Is that just the catfish swimming upriver? How do they get way up there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll comment on this. This because this is this is my map. 
those are sub watersheds that are delineated by drainage. So just because you have that poly polygon like that doesn't mean that flathead catfish are way at the head of that. It's just the area where flathead catfish occur right now. So that, that zone shouldn't be expected to include all the places where flathead catfish occur. It just occurs within that sub watershed, that basin. Okay. Okay. Now, if we go up, to the headwaters of the bay we look at the susquehanna we can see they they crossed up there now yep. that's all that's all you know really fresh water right yes yeah. that's that's pretty darn fresh but still you don't hear about them in the numbers that you hear the blue cats why is that well <laughs> partly i think that's a, a habitat thing i think blue catfish uh, thrive in an environment like the Chesapeake Bay. Obviously, they're doing very well in the bay um, versus, say, flatheads. And some have claimed that blue catfish just do better in a nutrient-rich environment. All right. Well, Ma Mary's mentioning now that they've been seeing more in the tidal Potomac recently, potentially coming from upstream uh, than the than the Occoquan. So that, that's a that's a really interesting one. But you know. We've 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 got a much bigger elephant of a catfish in the room. <laughs> now we're gonna have to dig into blue cats, but before we do that, before we do that, I want to remind everyone about the Great Chesapeake Invasives Count. Zach, can you pop up slide six, please? Because oh, and he's already got the link up. Man, Zach is a wizard. Uh, this is a program presented by Yamaha Rightwaters. It's run by CCA Maryland. The cool part is you can go fishing and engage in citizen science and win prizes all at the same time. Now, all you got to do is take your invasive species, any of these three we're talking about tonight, put it on a ruler, take a picture, and uh, register on the iAngler app. You got to do that first. Register on the iAngler app. It's free. It's free. Then you take the picture, you upload it to iAngler. It takes all of, I don't know, a minute and a half. And when you do so, your name goes into the hat for the prize drawing that month. Now, if you got the fish open up its stomach and take a picture of the contents and get a second entry. So if you catch 10 blue cats and take those gut pictures along with the picture of the fish on the ruler, you've got 20 entries for that month's prize drawing. There's all kinds of cool stuff. You can win all kinds of fishing gear. I've won it before. I, won, I didn't win last year, but I won like the year before. And the really neat thing is, you know, your your uh, the location is in the photo's metadata and it's not shared so you don't have to worry about giving away a spot but it lets the managers and the scientists see where these fish are being caught how big they are and what they're eating so you get to engage in a little bit of citizen science as you go out and have fun fishing and win prizes i mean that's pretty darn cool so uh you know got to remember that the chesapeake great invasives count that that is something everybody should be joining in on and i've already made i made six entries within the past week so i'm hoping i win a prize we'll see <laughs> all right zach let's go ahead and put up the next slide here we got we got slide seven coming as we start to Does talk it count about if i Brett, use all the fish like all thousands of catfish i get this summer electro fishing <laughs> come on I don't, I, don't, I don't think so i don't know <laughs> You got us the CCA guys, but I'm hoping I'll let you fish. I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. <laughs> we have our own fishing tournament. That, uh, <laughs> All right, let's get up the next slide, and we're going to take a look at the spread of the blue cats. And this is a crappy old slide, but I still wanted to include it. Uh, it's dated, but it goes way back. And it shows you at first we were just talking about a couple Virginia trips. And then a few years later, they were up into the Potomac, and they were really in the Virginia trips. And then a few years later, there's even more of them. And Zach, go ahead and just cycle us through right to the next slide, which shows you know the more current distribution. This is just in the state of Maryland. Remember, all those years we were looking at the other slide, they weren't even really in Maryland. Now, look at all those blue areas where we got blue cats. Bottom line, if it's a tributary attached to the Chesapeake Bay, basically, you, you've got blue cats in it now. And... Uh, it is just a shocking numbers. I think one of you guys mentioned earlier, you can electroshock and in a couple minutes see a thousand of them. Yeah. It, yep. it is shocking numbers of fish. So who wants to, no, why don't you tackle the, the history? I'm sure you know how they got here, right? Yep. 
So in the 70s, back when the bay wasn't so healthy and there wasn't much fish left in the bay and it was super polluted, uh, the fisheries managers in uh, Virginia were like, well, we got to do something for anglers. We got this fish down south from the Mississippi River um, system that can grow real big, taste real good, can fight hard, it's easy to catch, and it can survive a lot of, it can survive really bad water. So let's put them in, in a couple rivers in Virginia, and that'll, uh, but thinking that they probably can't handle the saltiness of the bay. But there was no real ecological risk assessments back then. People didn't know how, as much about invasive species biology. Like now, today, we would know that's a bad idea. 50 years ago, all this data hasn't been established by them. So there, they get there, and it turns out that they can spread, uh, th uh, they can tolerate some salinity, and better than the snakeheads. And then they move up and out of the, the tributaries of Virginia, and then they went up and around the bay, spread out all the tributaries more, and then they came back around to the eastern shore, getting to the eastern shore about 20 years ago. Um, and so the western side of the bay, they've been here, they've been there a lot longer, about 30 years longer. Uh, in, in most tributaries, but they more re are more recent to the eastern shore, which is my lab is trying to figure out a little bit more now that we're in the early stage of them arriving here, tracking um, how things change as as they establish more and their effects on the ecosystem here. Now, recently, very recently, Governor Moore requested a federal declaration of a disaster, uh, commercial fishing disaster over these fish. Is the blue cat really that big a deal? Yeah, I, I personally, I think the blue cat can pose like an existential threat to the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem in that it is so abundant in some of these rivers where it makes up 70 up to 70 percent of the biomass to some of these tributaries. And what that means is if you were to take a net and scoop everything out of that tributary, including the plankton, microscopic plankton and the plants, 70 percent by weight would be catfish, uh, blue catfish. And so with sheer numbers, it doesn't matter what they're eating at that, uh, with that numbers, whatever they're eating is gonna be suffering. But my lab is doing some work in the Nanticoke River particularly, and the things that they find, we find most in their diet, the top five things we find most in their diet are number one, white perch, number two, gizzard shad, three is blue crabs, and then it's like river herring, so like alewives and blueback herring, as well as just any, as well as vegetation too. So there's the smaller ones we're finding are eating more vegetation, scavenging, eating plants, things like that. And then as they get a little bit bigger to get to about 19 inches long or so, about a foot and a half long, they start transitioning to where their mouths are big enough so they can effectively eat fish and then, and small, and crabs. And so now then they switch to a more carnivorous diet eating more crabs and fish. And then as they get bigger and bigger, they'll eat anything and everything they get their mouths around. They can eat, uh, we found adult wood ducks in their stomach. It's actually the, the second catfish we cut open in the study had a wood duck in its stomach. Wow. Um, we've seen turtles, we've seen muskrats, uh, gulls, snakes. Uh, we've seen multiple big rocks in their stomach, whole adult striped bass, you name it. So pretty much there seems like they are opportunistic generalists. Meaning, have you seen Have you seen cow nose rays? Because I'm I'm looking for a little hope here. You know, <laughs> a little bright you know, side. No, no cow nose haven't rays. Haven't seen cow nose rays. They're a little difficult shape for uh, for catfish to, to process just based on being so wide. All right. Well, I <laughs> wish. I wish. Uh, well, you know what? One thing I'd like to address here is the fact that if you talk to those guys in Virginia, right? They've built quite a fishery on the James, on the Rap. They've got a lot of guys going for them. They've got a lot of guides going for them. They get a little upset when we in Maryland start talking about, oh my God, we got to get rid of all the blue cats. Um, some of them really, they, they're really happy with the blue cats being there. So why do we have a different attitude in, in neighbor states just going from Maryland to Virginia? Any ideas? So Maryland's got more of the, the estuary of the bay. Virginia's got more of the mouth of the bay, or the, the yeah, the mouth of the bay. The So down there, it's a little more salty. They're not getting as much as those tidal rivers, and so they really just have, like, the James and the York and things like that, um, Elizabeth River, or, River, like, things like that, where it is 
they it's not as productive as the Maryland side of the bay. When Maryland is it, it's it's got all these rivers bringing in all these nutrients where it's the uh, nur nursery ground. It's one of the largest and most productive ecosystems in the entire world where so much nutrient is coming in and and all those mouths of all those different small rivers, rivers all along the eastern shore and the western shore. And because of that, we are getting more of the, we have more area that's being affected negatively. And that's affecting the, the larger crab industry in Maryland. So Maryland, Marylanders, I heard something like that. People here eat crabs. I don't know. It's, it's a rumor that I've heard. And so <laughs> blue catfish are estimated, just one estimate out of, based off of one river in, um, in Virginia, uh, shows that they eat, the, the blue cab population at the mouth of that one river eats about 2.5 million crabs per year. Now multiply that by all the different tidal rivers all around Maryland, and that's tens of millions of crabs at least being eaten by blue catfish each year. And so Maryland's got a lot bigger crab industry that poses a lot more threat to the Maryland recreation ecosystem than it does to Virginia. Uh, Maryland's also got a bigger striped bass or rockfish fishery and so that may post a bigger threat uh, as well. So, yeah. Zach, go ahead and bring up the next slide because it speaks right to what Noah was just talking about. Uh, uh, Dr. Joe, you want to explain to us what this is a picture of? Yeah, we just uh, got that photo from one of our biologists who was up fishing blue catfish on the, on, the, on the flats, and they gutted it, and all these crabs popped out of it. Um, I think it was last week or the week before last. It was just evidence that they are consuming blue crabs, and that just kind of highlights what you know Noah was just saying, uh, that they are a potential problem for our blue crab fishery, right? They're definitely a predator of blue crabs. But I, I do want to follow up and say uh, not everyone in Virginia you know, wants to maintain a trophy fishery. Uh, they, some do recognize the problem with blue catfish, particularly researchers at uh, you know, VIMS have published on, mm -hmm. on that. Um, folks at a, you know, Department of Wildlife Resources have commented on that. They, 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 the, they see it, right? In the James River, a lot of the blue catfish have become so abundant that they've stunted in growth because, you know, resources have essentially run out, allowing for those trophy-sized catfish to grow. So in some places, they don't have a trophy fishery any longer, which is what they wanted back in the, you know, 60s, 70s. So um, not everyone shares that same sentiment that um, they want to protect blue catfish. And I think it's common whenever we have an invasive fish that people see both the good and the bad and really depends on your perspective what, what you want. Here we have to draw upon a general consensus. And generally in Maryland, we recognize the problems owed not just to blue crabs, but as Mary will point out, also to anadromous fish. Um, into some of our other resources here, maybe wood ducks as well, maybe some, um, maybe some snakes. And in my opinion, white catfish, which is a native to the Chesapeake Bay. And um, we have, you know, there are some published uh, reports out of North Carolina where there are problems with blue catfish interacting with white catfish. We want to try and maintain the natives we have in the Chesapeake Bay. And so there are, you know, there are some other species beyond just the commercial industry that um we are concerned about here in the bay as well now now kent's got a great question here and this i, I don't know why it had never even occurred to me he's asking will the dnr implement the same catch and kill regulations as with snakeheads we need this to protect our crabs and fish and the really interesting thing is from my discussions with a lot of the folks like yourselves the blue catfish does seem to be the one that really has everybody scared like, oh, my God, this could really mess things up. And yet it seems that we do have stricter uh, regulations regarding the snakehead in the transportation. Like, I don't think there's a rule you can't have a live blue cat in your boat, is there? So I think there's a there's a you know, that's a in my opinion, a misconception. We um, we have. We encourage harvest for both snakeheads and blue catfish. Yes. And we did, never did have a regulation that required people to kill snakeheads. We right. simply said, if you want to possess one alive, then, or if you want to possess one, then it has to be euthanized. Now, there's a difference between that and blue catfish. 
one of the reasons is that snakeheads came on the scene in 2004. Blue catfish have been in our waters for a long time, and it's very easy to confuse blue catfish with channel catfish with white catfish, right? Snakeheads are very unique in the way they look. So it's a little bit easier to say if you want to possess a, lot, a snakehead, then you have to euthanize it. If you want to possess a blue catfish, right, and we require you to euthanize it, you think about those watermen who bring in 4 million pounds every year, or at least this past year, of, of catfish. You think they're going to be able to sit with their haul saying and, or their pound net and yeah. clobber every single catfish before it goes to market? The answer is no. So it's it. Plus, we have recreational folks who are out there catching catfish, bringing it home. It's our number one, two target, number two target. Uh, for recreational anglers in the state. And it has been that way for decades. People love catfish. Now we're going to say, look, every time you catch a catfish, you know, you have to pay attention to whether it's blue and channel. If it's blue, you have to kill it. We well, might end up with a lot of channels that get killed that, as a result yeah. of that. Yeah, right? totally. That's a, that's a great point. Like I said at the very beginning, I catch plenty of fish. I really do. And I have trouble sometimes telling them apart. Sometimes it's really obvious, but yeah. sometimes it's really not. You know, some of them look close. Oh, shucks. We lost John Page's comment. Zach, bring it back. <laughs> Thank you. So John Page is saying, hi, John Page. Uh, the Vim study about crab consumption of the James concentrate on the lower river where there are lots of crabs. Upriver, their primary forage is gizzard shad. Check the diet studies, especially from Virginia Tech. Like snakeheads are opportunistic. They eat whatever lives where they are. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I, yeah, but I... I got to say, I'm as, as a, a total crab head who like, I can't go for a week during the summer months without having crabs on the table. Um, I, I've been really depressed the last few years at the kind of catches I've been seeing. And I recently saw a picture, which honestly I dismissed because it was on Facebook. And I thought, man, don't believe anything you see on Facebook. It's all garbage. But it was, and it is, but there were a guy had opened up a blue cat that he had caught near Thomas Point. Well, I'm talking like a week or two ago, and it was full of crabs. Uh huh. And I'm like, oh my god, no! Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe uh, yeah. It's really, I mean, what we really see is it's like in the uh, in our research study on the Nanticoke, where we're covering all the different regions of the Nanticoke, like more fresh and more salty. And what we're seeing is like just like like towards vienna where, where it's a little bit more salty all the catfish have crabs in their stomach you go up to sharp town or the boat ramp is that we often go to four miles up river uh there you only get a couple crabs in the stomachs you go up a couple you go up in the marshy hope a little bit further you're not going to see any crabs in their stomach and so it really depends on where and so the lower portions of these rivers is where they're going to be eating more crabs because that's where there are more crabs and that looked to me very much like what Mary was chiming in about is that they are just opportunistic feeders. Absolutely. They're going to eat what they run across. Oh, and he got a backup. Yep. Yep. Uh, what's, what's around them? So uh, I'm saying we should probably institute a ban on blue catfish everywhere the crabs go. Is that cool? Ah, that? Good I'm luck. With that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're going to listen. <laughs> hmm. yeah. All right. Well, Wendy's asking if electrofishing can help catch blue cats, then why are why are we doing that to reduce numbers? Or I think maybe the question should be why aren't we doing that to reduce numbers? But I think there was discussion over commercial electrofishing. I'm not sure if it was Virginia or Maryland, but there was discussion over that. Both. Um, oh. We've been we've been discussing it in house for a number of years. Virginia implemented it. Um, they have. Uh, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have issued, v VMRC um, has issued two permits uh, to allow watermen to electrofish uh, for catfish. There are a number of requirements. We've looked into it. Uh, we, you know, Noah and I are proposing a study to examine the effectiveness of boat electrofishing and knocking back the numbers. There are some logistical challenges. Um, if you've seen boat electrofishing going after blue catfish, you would know that we're not exaggerating when we say hundreds of blue catfish come up at a time and it can be, and they, once they come up, if you don't nab them and they go back down, you're not going to get them again, right? Mm -hmm. And at least not that day, because uh, there's a fright bias associated with electrofishing. 
So what that means is we need an awful lot of boats, a lot of people to go out and catch all the catfish that come up relatively quickly. Now, as Mary will point out, we tried something. <laughs> we did that on the Patuxent River when we did a mark recapture project. And we had three or four electro fishing boats out there. My mind gets fa uh, hazy sometimes. But we, we had some boats out there and we caught them and it, we still didn't get them all. So there are still some logistical challenges, even with electro fishing, because we, we reach gear saturation. There are just so many catfish there that one boat electro fisher doesn't catch them all. But the project Noah and I are talking about is using boat electro fishing maybe to get the biggest of the catfish that we see uh, on the water. Maybe that's a little bit more of a, a realistic goal. Man, call, call me next time. You guys zap them. I'll be in there. I'll, I'll be ready to get them. <laughs> yeah. Be there yeah. with my boat. Well, and then and then we have to deal with what you do with them, right? Yes. Well, speaking of what you do with them, I actually that is a point that yeah. I wanted very much to bring up. Um, the the state is often promoting eating them. They are good to eat. They're a nice white meat. I love the I love uh, there's a uh, blue cat uh, taco recipe I love. And if you go to fishtalkmag.com, Zach, I was saving this link for later, but we can go ahead and pop it up. We have an article that has the famous banned from the kitchen blackened catfish recipe. Uh, if you follow the link and if you do the blackened catfish recipe, it's fabulous, but you want to do it on the grill. If you do it in the house, you will smoke out the house. So be careful okay. with banned from the kitchen blackened catfish. Oh, I but agree. Uh, blackened catfish on the grill is the best way to have catfish. You that or fried. But it's, it's fabulous. Cool. It's fabulous. And so uh, interestingly, we've come across some other things folks can do with these fish. Uh, there are some church groups and food banks that will mm -hmm. take blue cats if you don't want to eat them. Um, and one of our contributors, Eric Packard, mm -hmm. um, he does not eat fish of any sort, which I find really weird because he goes fishing every day. But what he does with his blue cats is he always keeps them all and he takes them to a uh, animal rehabilitation facility that has raptors and evidently, raptors? yes uh -huh. the osprey and the eagles mm -hmm. love the blue cats mm -hmm. i knew that too They're uh, totally hip uh, educators from the uh pokemon state uh park just yesterday picked up some catfish for me after we take the stomach and the the reproductive organs and things like that out we could toss them out or donate them to the mm -hmm. we also do them to the local salisbury zoo to feed their animals mm -hmm. um this is a fun way to enrich them and Give them something a little different in their diet. And I saw Mary's yeah. comments pop up about uh, when you're cleaning them, taking out the strip. There it is, the dark strip down the side. Um, and, and even I would even say with the smaller ones, like, heck, you can barely even notice. As they get yeah. bigger and bigger, it becomes a different story. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, gosh, we don't have a ton of time left. But we should spend a little bit of time, or you guys should spend a little bit of time, uh, talking to us about, you know, Harvesting these fish, what's the right way? What's the right size is, of course, always a big issue. Mm -hmm. The right size for yeah. blue cats. Well, as Mary pointed out, I mean, one of the concerns early on was that the larger catfish bioaccumulate toxins, right, into that right. red muscle. And that's not different than what happens with striped bass and some of the old, larger fish. So Maryland Department of Environment often encourages people to remove that red muscle before consuming the fish as a way of you know minimizing risk nonetheless um, because we are encouraging harvest and we want people to be safe when they're consuming the fish we're expanding the work we're doing with maryland department of environment to test for these biocontaminants across mm -hmm. multiple rivers in the chesapeake bay so that we can better improve right these consumption advisories that they post online and are available to everyone so here recently I went out where while Noah was on the Nanticoke and I took some of those blue catfish. I just recently got some snakeheads from the fish lifts up at Conowingo um, this past week and processed them for contaminant uh, testing later on. So we are trying to build a, a, a safer consumption advisory so people feel better about the, the product that they're eating so that they don't have to worry about the size that they're catching. Whatever size they catch, hopefully they'd be interested in eating. Interesting. And, and uh, John Page and Mary were both chiming in there with right on comments. 
um you know i i got i got uh oh we get we didn't get up slide 10 zach can you throw up slide 10 real quick because uh, you know i just want to make sure we get it in there it's not just what they eat but how much they eat right that's right that's right yeah this this is something i'm going to be presenting next week in annapolis at their cafe scientific they are interested in inviting i can't really say that word without smiling <laughs> um they're, they're, they're they want to hear some information about invasive fish so i put this together um this is actually some information we had shared with our outgoing secretary uh, a couple of years ago and it's based in science based in research published out of virginia and it's you know yeah the, the problem with these invasive fish i'm like perhaps a channel catfish, is blue catfish get really abundant, as we've talked about, and they also get really big, right? Up to 100 pounds, maybe over 100 pounds in some cases. The largest in Maryland is 84 pounds. So they get really large. As they get larger and as they get more abundant, they eat more resources. And that is the key to the, the, the problem, right? That's what we're, we're dealing with here. And so um, we're looking at you know, maybe up to 10% body weight being consumed by a catfish on average, about three or 4% body weight per day. We're talking, that's, that could be a lot of food. So, you know, when, when we're talking about consumption of a single fish, and then we multiply that by the number of fish that are in a particular area, right. And expand it out uh, to the bay. I think it's easy to consider how these, as this species may be impacting resources like blue crabs perhaps like our anadromous fish like yeah, it's like man they're in gizzard chad people love gizzard they're, chad they're right? eating like everything but it leads to yeah. another question right and i want to pitch this one to noah because uh i recall in your in your bio it mentioned that you studied the blue cat's defensive mechanism right yeah. So if we've got all these blue cats swimming around like crazy, how come rockfish aren't eating just as many little blue cats as blue cats are eating little rockfish, right? Why isn't that balancing out? Maybe you can tell us about their defensive uh, abilities. Yeah. So um, I'm working on a collaboration with Dr. Kate Galloway at uh, Nichols State University in, in Louisiana. She is an expert on, on both fish spines and invasive fish spines. She used to study the, the defensive spines of lion, invasive lionfish in Florida. Um, and I, I realized I was like, we're getting all these catfish. We have tons of these spines. Let me send you some of these spines for you to do your analysis. And we're preparing that to, uh, to publish that right now. But what it seems like is the small catfish have these, relative to their body size, have these really large spines. And these spines are like both on the top, a dorsal spine, and then two pectoral fin spines. And all these spines have a locking mechanism where normally you get something like a large mouth bass, they got some spines on the top. But if you put your hand over it down, the, the fin rays go down. Catfish can lock it in place so you can't lower it down. So it makes it harder for like a predator to just uh, smush those spines down with their mouth. And their spines are pretty large relative to their body size when they're small. And what that does is it's a it's a energy efficient way of making the 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 catfish harder to eat. Basically, by instead of sure you you may be this thick or wide, but with your spines you're this wide. And so something needs a mouth that's this wide to eat you, even your body, even though your body's just this big. So it makes it harder for larger predators to eat them. So mm -hmm. really that their spines are like hypodermic needles. They're super sharp and they have a mild venom, like a, like a bee sting kind of venom. It's not going to kill you unless you have a allergic reaction to it, but it, uh, it, it hurts. And so they can try to eat them. They bite it. They, they hurt. But as they get larger and larger, relative to their body size, their spines wear down and get shorter and they don't put much effort into growing these spines long, larger just because if you're a 50 pound catfish, you don't really need your spines to avoid being eaten, nothing to eat you anyway. So they don't really have mechanisms to repair their spines. So, so just to try and give us a, a, just a frame of reference, you've got a 24 inch rockfish. Okay. Yep. Chunky, not huge. 24 incher, right? Yeah. And you've got an eight-inch blue cat. Can that rockfish eat that blue cat? Uh, probably. Um, really? I'd say probably. Uh, you like basically you take the mouth of a rock of a striped bass, you hold the catfish. If its spines can fit into the mouth, we wall wreck. It can swallow. So we'll eat them. So the spines don't. It's not like the fish can't eat the catfish because the spines will rip it up inside. It'll. 
Oh, it can be a choking hazard, yeah. for sure. I've, I have seen water moccasins choke on trying to eat a catfish. Same here. Right? It, it launches, it, they, they pierce the, the, the throat of the fish. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's a potential risk. Just because they, they can eat it doesn't mean they, they necessarily love to eat catfish because of the spine. So, yes, like that 24-inch striper can eat the blue catfish, but because of those spines that it's a choking hazard and it's a venom, makes it less pleasant to eat. And so really the only thing the other eating the catfish that we see, the most predators, I mean, other than like osprey and eagles, is other catfish. We see a lot of bigger blue catfish eating smaller blue catfish because they got big, tough mouths. And they don't care. They're crushing clams with their mouth. They don't care about the spines. They'll crush the spines. Plus, they've eaten yep. everything else. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we are. Oof, we got to. We got to move it along a little bit. We're getting a little short on time, but I got a couple more questions. I did. Well, Jason's got a question. Has DR, DNR done any research up north in the bay on blue cats? And he says it's insane up here. And he's right. He's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, brief answer. What do you got? Brief answer, uh, the research we do on the upper bay largely is counting, right? So we get an estimate of how many catfish are in their nets, um, how many catfish are showing up at the fish lift. We're going to be bow fishing in June, so we'll get an estimate of how many catfish we bring in on a, on a bow fishing trip. Um, and then we get commercial harvest. But that's, that's the kind of research we're doing in the upper bay right now. So what shocked me was how many people sent us at Fish Talk reader reports of catching big blue cats when they were eeling for rockfish at Pools Island. I mean, it was like we were just got constant, constant reports. Yeah, I was eeling for rockfish and I caught three big blue cats. And it's just yeah. like, whoa. So Joseph saying he's heard they're predators, not scavengers, primarily live food. Correct. I catch them drifting eels. There you there you go. Correct. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> correct. And I think it's a misconception that, and we've been trying to fight it, not just us, but I think a lot of people that blue catfish are somehow bottom scavengers or somehow bottom feeders or something along those lines. That is not true. Um, and, and blue catfish do come up off the bottom. They are catfish, but they are a predator. They come up off the bottom. And as we've talked a lot tonight about, they eat a lot of different species, right? I've, I've yeah. caught them on jig. Multiple yeah. times I've caught them on jig. In fact, I caught one on a jig at Point Lookout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was kind of shocked at, but it happened. Yeah. Uh, so, going, going, going off of that, even like something like a lot of people they get turned off, not just because they're a bottom feeder and they're muddy, but what I like to say to that is people love crabs. They're the ultimate scavenger bottom feeders. They live in the mud. <laughs> they taste good. So why can't catfish? So oh, they taste great. They taste exactly. great. Exactly. They taste great. Kent's, Kent's asking, can the DNR make jug fishing legal on rivers other than the Potomac? I, well, I know on but the that's probably commercial watermen do that currently. Yeah, I think I think you can jug fish. Um, Mary can chime in, too. I thought there were some people jug fishing on the Patuxent River. Um, on the Potomac, you certainly can. But then we get into all kinds of I mean, that's kind of getting out of the science realm and into the regulations realm too there's a there's i'm sure a lot that goes into deciding where and when you can do that kind of fishing I for example will, I, if you've got rockfish around yes you don't really want people jug fishing yes and i will say look any of these ideas like um some watermen have suggested boat electrofishing a, a waterman just recently suggested to me a change in trot line length that that can be set for 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 blue cats in the upper bay anytime we have these suggestions we can get them to our Sport Fish Advisory Commission or our Tidal Fish Advisory Commission. And those suggestions can be discussed. And in light of all these things you're mentioning, like the striped bass fishery or these other issues that, are, that could be going on out there, um, particularly with these invasive fish, options are on the table. So if there's an idea that you want to propose, don't be quiet about it. Come to Sport Fish, come to Tidal Fish, or send a note over to my director and we can discuss it um internally and, cool. and with the public cool that's great and simon's asking what's the best way for us to log report catfish towards the studies again simon i'm going to direct you right back to that link zach would you put it up one more time uh join in the chesapeake invasive species count that gets all the numbers into the right hands and that that's the way to do it it really is easy it'll take you five minutes to sign up on iAngler. it's completely free 
yeah. then all that data is going to the right place. Um, now, I, the way quick, whoop, I knew another question was going to get him before I could even get it out of my mouth. Uh, James is asking about the middle bay. I've seen a few, but not many. James, I found that it shifts quite a bit with the salinity. And mm. to this point, I've gone out there and caught a bunch or caught none. And Thomas Point's kind of right on that 10 parts border that you that was mentioned earlier, which is kind of, or was that snaking? But wasn't 10 parts per, uh, is it 10 parts per million or 10 parts per thousand? 10 parts per thousand. And that's, that, that would be for snakehead. Catfish are also pretty tolerant of, of brackish water conditions, but I think you're, you're, you're dead on. It's going to, it's going to vary by precipitation and it's going to vary by temperature, seasonal temperatures. Right. So. And now we got the question, is there a relationship between the catfish and the snakehead? I'm not sure what relationship James is going for there. They seem to occupy a little bit different areas of the river where snakeheads really like the shallowest, most densely vegetated areas, like uh, further up in the the creeks, whereas catfish more like the the river, like the the bigger parts of the river, the the river channels and things like that. Now, the catfish do like to be around structure too, kind of ambushing prey out of uh, the areas, but you're going to find the catfish more on the main stem river, snakeheads more in those creeks covered in uh, lily pads. And there's... There could be some overlap, right? Yeah. So we do see blue catfish entering shallow water areas seasonally. And then we also see snakeheads in the winter in deeper water areas too. So there could be some overlap, but no, is 100% correct. They're kind of in different areas. So I do, I do want to give real quick, a quick synopsis on the whole blue cat fishing thing, because it is very simple. Uh, it is again, red hot action. All you got to do is get some cut fish, gizzard shad, bunker, you can even use chicken livers. They work great. Put them on an 8 ot to a 10 ot hook, 4 foot, 40 pound test leader. Doesn't have to be fluorocarbon. These fish are not leader shy. You want to put a fish finder or an egg sinker above the leader so you can send it down to the bottom and work channel edges and holes. That's kind of the main areas. In upriver areas, it's snaggy holes. Um, but it's really a very simple form of fishing, and it is just red, red, red hot action. The one thing to look out for is there's pressure changes. Does it, Do we know why pressure changes? Pressure uh, uh, The wrong pressure change does seem to affect the bite on these fish. And it's like the only thing that mm-hmm. I've been able to determine does affect the bite. Otherwise, it's like they eat night and day. Do you guys have any clue why that is or what's going on? With, with pressure changes, I... I look at more or less tides and how tide influences, you know, the bite and maybe time of day, you know, catfish tend to be a little bit more nocturnal, but um, I don't know anything about really how pressure might influence it. So I know that a lot of fish in general with uh, pressure changes, uh, fish in, in general, like relatively stable conditions. Now, like things like catfish and snakehead can tolerate wide wide swings of, of conditions, especially like these these extremists. Uh, but the when it's, when it's if you have rapid changes in weather condition, it could kind of cause them to pause and then like shift the feeding pattern a little bit. It just it th- it can throw them off temporarily. Uh, I've seen that with other fish like pickerel. If the weather's going right. up and down, you're not going to get a pickerel to bite. It's some, it, it seems even more important with some species as opposed to cats, but it does seem to have an effect. Now, folks, we're getting out of the wire here. We're very close. And Zach, I want to know what the results of our, our poll were. I want to know how many people chimed in and let us know. Have you caught one of these? Woo, that was fast. Okay. 75% of viewers who responded have caught either blue catfish or snakehead or both in the past year the ma- uh, that's interesting now this is interesting the majority of anglers were targeting those fish no flathead catches that's interesting but what that tells me is not only are anglers going out there and accidentally catching the snakes in the blues they're making a day out of it yeah uh-huh. that's yeah. that's the target that is yeah. terrifically interesting that's what we want yeah it's terrifically interesting yeah yeah, and we have we have charter boat. If you know, if you're new to fishing, we have charter boat captains. We have guide services. We've got people like Noah. <laughs> I mean, we've got people <laughs> who you know that organize uh, tournaments and can get you into in into the fishing these. So even if you're if you want to target them and you want to be a better better at targeting them, you know there are all these services right now in the state that can help you do that. Yeah. Now, speaking of which, oh, 
I do want to plug that we, uh, if you have never gone for an invasive species, but like to learn, um, my lab is hosting our second annual invasive species fishing tournament in the Nanticoke River. We're getting the details finalized in these few days, but it's shaping like it'll be sometime in the uh, striped bass season closure at the end of July where you don't have anything to fish for, so you might as well give these a try. Uh, most likely July 23rd. And there it's going to be at uh, finalizing details again, but most likely at Cherry Beach Park in Sharptown. We have... Uh, several extra, a bunch of rods that people can borrow that are pre-rigged for catfish. We can show you how to, how to use them, how to fish for them. There's areas of that park that you can even fish without a license, or specific areas that are deemed uh, license-free fishing areas. We got all the gear you need. Um, I will be there with a bunch of other volunteers to teach you how to go for these species. So uh, we'll keep an eye out for some information and we'll, we're going to post it wide and broad, but uh very the cool. River Invasive Species Fishing Tournament presented by Salisbury University coming out again this summer. Very cool. Please make sure you shoot me an email when you get that date nailed down. We will put it in the new section on Fish Talk. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely help spread the word. Um, now, All the Fish Talk go to are used for my lab's research on these invasive species too. And then you get to bring home the meat to eat if you like. And we should be having uh, fried catfish there as well. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, we're basically out of time. But before we wrap up, I um, did want to give each of you a turn. Let's let's start with Dr. Joe. Okay. Uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that you feel is really important for people out there watching today to know about invasives in general or any of these specific feature uh, species? Yeah. Something that we haven't talked about. Did we miss anything really critical? The one critical thing that I, I try to remind people of is prevention and don't release your pets from your aquarium. Don't, you know, introduce a fish or an aquatic organism um, intentionally wanting to start a fishery or because you want it to live. Uh, there are alternatives to that. Feel free to contact DNR if you have questions on how to address that. What we don't want is additional issues in the bay. We are trying to protect it from Alabama bass, silver carp, and it's it's increasingly more difficult with social media being what it is now and the ability to spread around these new exotic species. So prevention is key. Please don't introduce anything. Okay, very cool. Now, Noah, before you talk, well, I was just I was going to ask Mary to chime in. Uh, please don't stock any fish or plants from your aquarium or pond. There we go. All right, Noah, what do you got? Yep, yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, but what I like to kind of say with invasive species is. There's so much, so so many of them around for us to, to handle on our own, us like people in the fisheries like me, Joe, and Mary, uh, that we need your help. So the best way to do your part to help with these invasive species is let's catch and eat them all to death. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I hope everybody takes it up on that. Yeah. Well, folks, we've gone over time. We really do need to wrap things up. We don't want to wear out the welcome with this esteemed panel or with you all. Uh, everybody who's participated, and that goes from – Dr. Joe, Dr. Noah, Mary, all the way down to everybody who's watched. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I also want to extend a thanks to Dave Sikorsky and Chris Dollar for coming up with this concept in the first place and then for pushing to make it happen. And a big major league thanks goes to Fish Talks kayak angling guru, production manager, and tech whiz, Zach Dittmars, who was like <laughs> beating me to the punch on pulling stuff up tonight. Did he do yeah. a fantastic job or what? Thursday, June 15th, same time, same channel, will be the next Chesapeake Perspective. This one will be examining expanding angler access. And that's a really important issue, particularly on the Chesapeake. We got like more shoreline than California, but sometimes it seems like you got nowhere to go fishing. So it's, it's a really, it's a pretty important thing. Folks, I hope you see you then. Uh, Noah, Joe, thank you so much. We thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, great. I can't say it enough. Everybody, have a good one.